just a little reminder, um, there is still the uh, ability for you to donate chocolate for the Chris Stingle service um, on Sunday if you would like. We are making other boxes next week, so if you would like to still donate chocolate for the Chris Stingle service, which is going to be online, but I'm still going to do a game show uh, online, and people are going to have my telephone number in their Chris Stingle boxes so that they can ring me up with the right things. Anyway, it's all sort of, it's in my head at the moment, but it's going to be an absolute bedlam in people's homes. But the wonderful thing is, I don't have a hundred children at the front screaming at me, clawing at me to get the chocolate on Christmas Eve. I can just sit in my lounge and just, it would just be lovely. So that would be nice. Um, yeah. And of course, I won't be able to sh uh, throw hundreds of quality streets into the church congregation either, which I shall miss out on. I should just chuck them at the lower thing. <laughs> it's really lovely to see you and um, I'd like to welcome Archdeacon Rosemary Mallet, uh, who is our Archdeacon of Croydon. Rosemary, it's lovely to have you uh, here with us and we very much look forward to your words later on. I'd like to begin with some words. When violence reigns and war seems never ending, Christ is our hope. When despair lies in wait and life loses meaning, Christ is our hope. When people claim to know what God alone knows and say the end is near, Christ is our hope. When life on earth is extinguished this year, next year, or in a hundred million years. Christ is our home. In sorrow and joy, today and tomorrow, in life and in death, Christ is our home. Let's pray. Gracious and Holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, diligence to seek you, Patience to wait for you, eyes to behold you, a heart to meditate on you, and a life to proclaim you, through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're now going to give out your food boxes. Um, it's, I feel a bit like a trolley doll in there. <laughs> Come fly with me. <laughs>
fantastic in doing all of the health and safety work to make sure that they're keeping the people who attend them safe and it's just tremendous. We are so proud of our parish priests for the way in which they work with the laity to make sure that you know the churches remain um, as safe as possible. And I think the last thing I said was that as we have the Bishop of London, who was the former chief nurse, chief medical officer, which one of those, um, if there was any idea that the church could be a super spreader of any sort, we'd been closed down long time. So it is just obvious that churches are actually providing a tremendous deep um, resource as opposed to being a place of um, potential danger. So that is, um, I, I hope that it remains so. So um, I think the topic that I was asked to uh, reflect on today, and it is um, still going and growing, but it's hope in a time of uncertainty. And, and obviously, these times that we live in, between, for us, the, the pandemic and Brexit at the moment, these are times which re raise really difficult questions. There's no two ways about it, you know. Um, questions about how we live, questions about just what we value and what our values really are. And so I'm going to, as I speak this evening, I'll have, it'll be bookended by scripture, there'll be reflections from some of my favourite psalms and songs and songwriters and poets, so I hope that that will give you some food for thought along with all that you've had um, already. So, um, begin with the scripture verse from Romans 8. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. I know that the song, one of the songs of the Beatles says that all we need is love. And that's true, but my friends, I'm here to tell you that I truly believe that what we also need is hope. That isn't to say that any one of the three great theological virtues are more or less important than the other. For in truth, like the Trinity, they are indelibly they're connected to each other. And the three separately are necessary, but they come into their own when they're viewed as equal parts of a whole. So, faith, hope, and love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You really shouldn't be thinking about one without the others, really. They're part of a whole. Because it's through faith that we have hope. And like the golden skin that holds all together for people of faith, it is the anchoring of God's love, expressed in the sending of His Son, the Word incarnate, that keeps us ever faithful, ever hopeful. I mean, it's the only reason that we're here, isn't it? It's the only reason we gather to worship our Lord Jesus Christ and to give thanks for God for sending it to us, especially now in Advent as we watch and we wait um, to, to commemorate and to mark the first coming of our Lord and to remember that all we do is to recognise each and every day that he comes into our lives, but that we wait for that eschatology when he will come again to be our judge and our always our redeemer. <coughs> This past year has been excruciatingly difficult for so many people. Some have lost loved ones, some have lost jobs, some have lost a real connection with the outside world, those who are self-isolating. I notice yes, there are some who have been self-isolating for the whole of the nine months. And while it is marvellous, Zoom is amazing, it doesn't replace that human need to really see, to really touch, to really smell, to taste, to hear the sounds of the world around us and the people we like, the people we love, and even sometimes those that we're not really that sure about either. The pandemic of 2020 has punched a huge hole in the world's understanding of itself and has come on top of the usual stuff of life, you know, the things that cause challenge and change in our lives, our relationships, employment or lack of it, health challenges, our housing, the environmental problems that we've got and so many more besides. That small bug, that virus, has amplified 
the challenges that everyone has had to face. Not all in the same way, of course, but no one has been unaffected by the changes in the world. Not the richest celebrity, or even the smallest island state, or indigenous community. People, indigenous communities in Brazil have been affected. Um, I think I read yesterday, George Clooney was talking about the fact, obviously, I don't think he says he's travelled out of their very largest street, America. <laughs> For the last nine months, they haven't travelled anywhere. So no one has been unaffected. And indeed, it is hard to say this when one thinks of the millions who have died or have been really negatively affected by the virus. But that bug has been a bit like the grit in the oyster that makes the pearl, you know? And this little virus has in so many ways, like the grit in the oyster, reminds us of the way in which the, the irritations and the challenges in our lives can become the pearls in our lives. And of the things that we must truly value in the world around us, and it's reminded us of the hope that we hold on to for ourselves and for the world. So in the midst of all this turmoil, one thing that almost all of us have in common, people of all faiths and none, is that we grasp for something to give us hope. My mother was saying to me this morning, she said, do you know, I can't understand Rosemary. When people of no faith and really have their backs against the wall, almost always they call out for God. Almost always. And, she said, and I said, it's because it's deep, it's so deep buried within us, it's in our psyche, and, and even though externally we can move very far away, in our deep in our psyche, when we reach back into, when we, when we reach down and draw on the reserves that were with us since our childhood, what remains with us is for many people what was instilled and inculcated in us when we were young, and it is that call for God to come and to take and help us. It is that hope that things will get better. It is that hope for healing. It is that hope that God will, with us, will be with us when we're going through turbulent times. And of course we know the Bible has a lot to say about hope, and we started with that scripture from Romans 8. It talks about how when we have faith in Christ, we have a hope for things eternal, things that will never decay, things that can't waste away. So C.S. Lewis of Narnia fame, and of course a great Christian writer said, hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people will think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It doesn't mean that we're to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were those who thought most about the next. Yeah? So Christians who did most for the present world were those who thought most about the next, what they hoped for. And so they worked for what they hoped for. So it's not escapism, it's what we're meant to do. Or as Hebrews 11 puts it, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Martin Luther captured it perfectly when he said, everything that is done in the world is done by hope. And so we look forward in hope. Well, 2020 has been, as I said at the beginning, such a challenging and difficult um, year. It's been marked, as we all know, by the Black Lives Matter protests worldwide, as people have come together to fight another virus, that virus of racism. And the popularity of the protests worldwide surprised many. But in 1955, the Martin Luther King Jr., that most of us have heard of and know about, he wrote, you know my friends, there comes a time 
and people get tired of being trampled by the iron feet of oppression. There comes a time, my friends, when people get tired of being plunged across the abyss of humiliation, when they experience the bleakness of nagging despair. There comes a time when people get tired of being pushed out of the withering sunlight of life's July, and they're left standing amid the piercing chill of an alpine November. There comes a time. 2020 was such a time. Ten years later, um, almost ten years later, in 1964, how many of you have heard of Sam Cook? Well, he penned one of my favourite helpful songs. It's called The Change Is Going To Come. And this was written at the height of the civil rights movement, and Cook believed that a day would come where blacks and whites could exist as equals. He got his inspiration from another um, uh, key musician of that time. Anybody could think who it might have been? Bob Dylan. And it was from listening to Blowing in the Wind. And that inspired him to believe that it was possible to hope for equality between all people. So his tale is down to earth. He sings about being born alongside a river that never stopped rolling. He sings about being run off when he tries to see a movie downtown and he's beaten to his knees when asking for help. He had his moments of fear and doubt. But through it all, he nurtured a faith and a conviction that change was on the way. And that conviction was called hope. The sadness and the depths and fury that burns of injustice above are not incompatible with hope because we humans are such complex creatures. Because hope isn't optimism that everything will be fine regardless. No. Hope offers us a clarity that amid the uncertainty ahead, there will be conflicts worth joining and there will be the possibility of winning some of them. If we didn't believe that, we wouldn't have banded together to fight against Hitler again with regard to the Second World War. That there was a conflict worth joining and the possibility of winning something. And one of these things most dangerous to this hope is the lapse for us into believing that everything was fine before disaster struck and that all we need to do is to return to things as they were before. Because although ordinary life before the pandemic, we might have looked back and now think, I think in the way that sometimes people look back to what I call marble mania. That's what I call it, you know, Poirot mania, marble mania, where you have that rose tinted glow over those types of villages and households, and it all seems rather lovely. But isn't it amazing that even in those what look like rose tinted sepia glasses that they wear, isn't it amazing? It's like, it's like a midsummer, midsummer isn't it? Most amazing places, and I've never seen so many murders in my life. <laughs> so, you know, it has this outer glow of being picture perfect, and underneath it, there are all the challenges and all the things that were there under the surface. So we can't believe that before the pandemic struck, all things were wonderful. Um, actually, there was difficulties, there was desperation, there was challenge for far too many human beings. There was an environmental and climate catastrophe, which there still is. And there was the obscenity of inequality, which the Black Lives Matter and George Floyd's murder brought to the surface. It's too soon to know what's going to come out from this calamity and this emergency, but it's not too soon to start looking for the chances and the opportunities that we can bring to change it and to make things happen. And it's that conviction that we can make things happen. It's that hope that change will come that continues to drive people 
of all shades, of all ethnicities, of all ages, of all cultures, to come together and to work to bring change and to bring equality. So here we are, not many weeks away from the cusp of 2021. And just have to acknowledge that in 2020 we witnessed daily displays of love that remind us of the many reasons why humans have survived this long. We've seen acts of courage, citizenship each day in our neighbourhoods and in our cities and in our countries. Despite everything that's happened, the fear of Covid, the clap for nurses and key workers, the mutual aid groups that have fed and cared for millions, the development of the vaccine. We've seen all of that happen and yet there is still so much uncertainty. Will there be another hard lockdown? How will the vaccines be rolled out? Are they really safe? When will it be our turn? What will happen after Brexit? Well, it seems like they kick down the road a bit further. <laughs> will we need to stock up on medicines and foods? Will the car park at Macro and Costco go beyond the road? <laughs> What does net zero carbon emissions really mean? And how will we achieve it for our future generations? There's lots of things to reflect on. There's lots of things to hope for. Uncertainty isn't something about today. It's not just for our times. It's, been all, it's always been with us. For in truth, really, who knows what tomorrow is going to bring? None of us know. My mother says this to me. My mother's 85. I absolutely adore her. I call her in the morning and I say, how are you? And she says, well, I'm fine. And she is. Otherwise, I get a little bit of her problems. <laughs> I woke up at 2 o'clock this morning and I'm about to sleep. Mm. <laughs> How's the weather? Oh, it's fine or it's not. But anyway, it's God's world. And so, who knows what the afternoon is going to bring? <laughs> <laughs> Our world today, Billy Graham said a long time ago. My mother actually met Billy Graham. Our world today is healed by readers, so desperately hungers for hope, yet uncounted people have almost given up. There is despair and hopelessness on every hand. Let us be faithful in proclaiming the hope that is in Jesus. And Corrie Ten Boom said, Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Cornelia Arnolda Johanna Corrie Ten Boom was a Dutch Christian watchmaker and later a writer who worked with her father, Caspar Ten Boom, her sister Betsy Ten Boom, and other family members to help many Jews escape from the Nazis during the Holocaust in World War II by hiding them in her home. She believed her actions were following the will of God and through her actions, she, it is felt that she saved at least 800 people. They were caught, they were arrested and sent to Reagan's book, Concentration Camp. She only one of her family that came out alive. The Hiding Place is her biography that recounts the story of her, of her family's efforts and how she found and shared hope in God while she was imprisoned in that concentration camp. Another saying from her that I absolutely love is, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit and trust the engineer. Yesterday, on Sunday, we were on the tram and we got to um, Croydon, I think it was George Street, and the driver said, oh, it was a common head and they had to stay here for a while. And some people got off, and my daughter said, mum, give it 15 minutes and then think about it. <laughs> Five minutes later, the train went on. <laughs> you see, she had hope. <laughs> Micah 7 tells us, but as for me, I will look to the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. So why should we have hope? 
is because the, God, the hope that God has provided for us is not merely a wish. Neither is it dependent on other people, on our possessions, or our circumstances for its validity. Instead, biblical hope is the application of your faith that supplies a confident expectation in God's fulfillment of his promises. Together with faith and love, hope is the abiding characteristic in a believer's life. Even though we are to have hope in the future God has for us, there's going to be times, of course, when we're going to suffer, we're going to have pain. And God tells us that suffering produces in us perseverance and character, which will lead to hope. Hope is powerful because it energizes and propels people forward, even when the odds are against them. It helps people find innovative ways to work around their constraints. Hope helps people rise above their circumstances. So while we're in the midst of suffering, we should look to Him, not only to give us strength, but to give us patience and the ability to endure. And if you remember when I read from Romans, I said, we wait in patience. My favourite um, psalm, just about to the end, my favourite psalm is the one that gave me a lot of hope during my teenage years, which were probably like many teenagers, but of course they were, like, they were unique and they were mine, so they were the most difficult of any teenage years. But I turned to the Psalms and they truly saved me from dark days and times when I thought that I wasn't going to hold on. And Psalm 27 is the one that just brought me back always. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil doers, doers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though wars rise up against me, yet will I be confident. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I want to end with a poem from a young man called Alexander King Paul. King is a name that friends and family called him. And it's, uh, it'll be part of the poem, and it's um, quite a sad poem, it's a sad story. So this is a young man who uh, lived in Greek Croydon. And he grew up a typical black teenager, that when he got to a certain age, he and his brother, although his mother was a lawyer and his father, I think, was an aid, you know, a national, international aid worker, so good middle class families, who and his brother got stopped and searched on numerous occasions. Um, and um, I, it was too long to go into it, but just because of his poetry and the way he lived his life, and he did extremely well, he um, ended up amazingly um, at the Conservative Party conference speaking to um, Theresa May, the Home Secretary, about Stop and Search and the impact on Stop and Search in his life. He also really had a tremendous impact on uh, journalists who have done some work on this issue up to this day. Anyway, um, this young man sadly died at the age of 21 of a brain tumour. He had so much, I mean if you start to just read how much he did in his short life between the age of 13 and 21, he was amazing. You know, he got a, I don't know, a double A star B to go to Warwick and he just did just wonderfully well. Um, and his book of poetry just um, takes you through what it's like to live as a young inner city black young man in Thornton Heath and the challenges that he faced. But what held for him, what held him together, was his faith and was his hope. So I'll just read a bit of this. This is his last poem, and it's called Peace of Mind. I think the last year of his life was spent in various hospitals praying and hoping for a cure. I think they ended up getting saved, collecting money and taking to journey, Germany for, you know, all types of treatment which didn't work. So 
and he says, I have witnessed the fragility of life. I have seen it ever way. I've seen the plights and the perils of urban decay, where young boys become misguided entrepreneurs, leading a life of crime in their prime, while young sisters and their bodies become sexualized before they even have had their period on time. I thought I'd seen it all, but to the might of God, I was blind. Although I was raised in the church, I left to search for something that I thought would soothe the suffering of my soul, not understanding that Christ was and is the panacea for my woes, and the only thing that could ever have made me whole. Please forgive the lack of dexterity in my lyricism, but this is not a poem. This is probably the closest I will ever get to ministry. So this is my sermon, with hopes for tomorrow. I still pray for my friends who drown their sorrows in the bottom of the bottle. Right now, I am rich in spirit, whilst they drink the richest spirits. I am living, they are living. I have finally accepted my father's love. Thank you very much. As we come to the end of this evening's service, we're going to finish with a The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. Most merciful oh God, we confess, confess to you before the whole company of heaven and as one another that we have, have sinned in thought and word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. The God makes speed to sinners. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You set me at liberty when I was in trouble. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you nobles dishonour my glory? How long will you love vain things and seek after false? But know that the Lord has shown me his marvellous kindness. When I call upon the Lord, he will hear me. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many that say, You will show us any good. Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their corn and wine and oil increase. In peace I will lie down and it is you, Lord, only, who make me dwell in safety. A reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning at verse 35. Keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. What I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. In your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, Lord God of truth. I commend my spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word. 
for my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to life and the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people who is Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. In the places of decision making and the places of powerlessness, come Lord, let your hope be known. In places of wealth and places of poverty, come Lord, let your hope be known. Where we are healthy, where we are sick, Come, Lord, let your hope be known. In the streets of plenty and in the dark corners and alleys, come, Lord, let your hope be known. Where people are oppressed and in the hearts of the oppressors, come, Lord, let your hope be known. In our places of worship and where there is no faith, Come, Lord, let your hope be known. In our places of learning and in the depths of our ignorance, come, Lord, let your hope be known. In our homes and our welcomes and where people couldn't care less, come, Lord, let your hope be Stir up your power, O God, and come among us. Heal our wounds, calm our fears, and give us peace and hope through Jesus Christ our Redeemer. Amen. And as our Saviour has taught us so Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Restore us again, O God of hosts, show us your countenance, and we shall be saved. Bless and keep us this night and always. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and be upon you this night and always. Amen. Amen. Can we just give our thanks to Archdeacon Rosemary for her words? Which is